A 50-year-old male patient who was affected in fire and presented with large burn in his body. A few days later, uh, he was desaturating, so having hypoxia. The x-ray, you can see there is multiple patchy consolidation all over the lung. And it's sort of like diffuse, it's present everywhere in the lung. So this is what we call by sort of grand glass appearance that have an adult respiratory distress syndrome. So looking back at the pathology or the um, definition of adult respiratory distress syndrome. So it's an acute or adult respiratory distress syndrome, which is diffuse inflammatory process that happen in the lung, and that will lead to the lung will be struggling to do its basic function. The patient will come with hypoxia mainly and very unwell, and also carbon dioxide retention, and the, the, uh, there is inability to diffuse the oxygen into the blood. That's why the PaO2, which is the pressure of um, uh, arterial oxygen, um, divided by the fractionated inspired oxygen. Basically, this compares between the amount of inspired oxygen and the amount of the oxygen in blood, all right? So because the lung has lost its function to diffuse oxygen in blood, so that ratio will be decreased, okay? So sometimes we call this as a Carico index as well, and it's a comparison between, like we said, the oxygen level in blood and the oxygen level that was inspired or breathed in. And this helps determine the degree of any problems with how the lung transfers oxygen to the blood, all right? So basically we're testing here ventilation or we're testing diffusion, all right, of the lung, okay? So pathophysiology of that process, it's a quite complex pathophysiology to think about, to be honest, but we're going to summarize it in a few points. So one, the lung has been exposed to any injury. This injury could be one mechanical injury, all right, or chemical injury or infective injury, all right, like very severe pneumonia or even um, sort of um, COVID virus or maybe chemical injury like or mechanical such as inhalational injury or trauma, and we're going to come to the causes later on. So after this injury, there was injury to the endothelium as well, injury to the endothelium or the capillaries inside the lung. That will lead to release of multiple of the macrophages and polymorphic nuclear leukocytes, and this will migrate inside the alveoli, okay, and this will lead to damage of type 1 pneumocytes, okay, type 1 pneumocytes and the release of inactivated surfactant. So type 1 pneumocyte basically secretes um, a surfactant, right? So the surfactant will not be really working and surfactant is basically responsible for the lung compliance. So basically the lung compliance will be affected. After a while these inflammatory cells will deposit inside the wall of the alveoli leading to formation of something called hyaline membrane. And this hyaline membrane will impede with or prevent the diffusion of oxygen from inside the alveoli to the blood vessels or the capillaries. So the whole process will be affected. So this is in summary or very small or very quick explanation. So if you look here, this is the endothelium, that big one, that is the endothelium. And you have here, this is the alveoli and this is the site between both of them. Okay. So stage one, you have injured endothelium, which happened due to the mechanical injury that we talked about or the chemical injury. And then you have release of neutrophils or macrophages, and this will migrate inside the alveoli. And these macrophages inside the alveoli will lead to paralysis of type 1. Type 1 pneumocytes will become very necrotic and release inactivated surfactant with a sort of edema inside it as well. And also other, other, other um, some sort of chemotactic like tumor necrosis factor interleukin-1 will be released as well. Formation of sort of fibrin inside the wall. This fibrin will continue formation along the wall of the alveoli and they will form what is called by hyaline membrane. Uh, or, I mean, actually you can see here, this is the hyaline membrane as well. So hyaline membrane formation will prevent the diffusion of oxygen which is present inside the alveoli into the capillaries around it. And that diffusion will be embedded and the patient will have sort of chronic, uh, sort of um, severe hypoxemia. So again, we can classify it into acute phase and later or a delayed phase, okay? So acute phase, there was destruction of the capillary endothelium. Like we said, sort of interstitial edema will happen after that. Migration of neutrophils and other, other cytokines like interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1. Damage of the basement membrane of the alveoli and formation of hyaline membrane. And also there will be sort of ventilation perfusion mismatch, okay? And this part, the ventilation perfusion mismatch is what will affect the PaO2 um, with the fractionated and inspired oxygen, okay? Later phase, there is fibroproliferation and organization of the lung tissue, or if the if resolution did not occur, there will be more collagen deposition in the wall or um, uh, um, basically fibrin deposition in the wall leading to formation of established hyaline membrane. So causes can be classified into chemical injury or mechanical injury or infection, mechanical or physical injury, or infection, or maybe something that is inhaled. The chemical injury could be any sort of like uh, heroin or um, many salicylic acid parpiturates, or even inspired in, um, aspiration. So um, aspiration pneumonia as well can lead to that. Mechanical trauma, talking about contusions and drowning and maybe burn and the sepsis and viral infection and so on. So this diagram sort of summarizes the main causes. But like we said, if you classify it into different categories, it will make it easier for you to remember. So if the patient had any sort of hit injury, maybe malaria or near drowning or maybe smoking, inhalation like we agreed and massive blood transfusion can lead to that as well dka and trauma to the lung like lung contusions 
and maybe fat embolism can lead to that as well. Aspiration pneumonia, we talked about it, this is sort of chemical. Acute pancreatitis, uh, this is severe sepsis, and maybe liver failure, some drugs like uh, um, aspirin and hone as well can lead to that. So adult respiratory distress syndrome, it's a quite severe inflammatory process that uh, leads to um, formation of hyaline membrane inside the lung, and these are the causes for it, okay? So there is something called Berlin criteria, I'm not gonna go through it to be honest, the so Berlin criteria is just to identify the severity of the uh, lung, and it's based on two things, the BAU2 measures, and it gives you sort of mortality risk for the patient. So you have mild case and moderate case and also severe case. Mild and also divided from 200 to 300 and then 100, and less than 100 severe adult respiratory distress syndrome, okay? so. Another question is asking about presence differential diagnosis of any sort of pulmonary infiltrate in the lung. So the way I think about it, think about any sort of infective cause. So any bacteria or viral pneumonia can lead to um, sort of infiltrates, right? You can also think about atelectasis, okay, which is post-operative, or maybe aspiration pneumonia, or maybe cardiogenic pulmonary edema, or maybe a sort of malignancy process. Or most importantly, uh, pneumoconiosis and asbestosis can lead to presence of lung infiltrate as well. Okay, so this are just basically quick classification. So for pneumonia, you obviously you need to treat it and get plug cultures and uh, CT scan, atelectasis and cardiogenic pulmonary edema, fusion as well, pulmonary embolism can lead to that. Most importantly, pneumoconiosis and asbestosis can lead to this as well. How would you manage patients with adult respiratory distress syndrome? There are many different ways to manage it, but the management basically is supportive and trying to prevent further infection that can happen to the patients. So supportive and prevent as well okay so supportive management here is to give the patient sort of all the sort of respiratory support that include positive and expiratory pressure you can do put them in prone position to evacuate all this kind of mechanical injury or the edema inside the lung so proning position is quite important and also um, um, maybe you can talk more about the proning position yeah significantly improve oxygenation and the ECMO is a very last stage that we can use as well, um, but there isn't any evidence that it makes the condition better, but sometimes it helps with some patients. And also we can do some sort of pharmacological steroids, that is to decrease edema, inhaled nitric oxide and prostacycline that will cause vasodilation of the capillary endothelium, um, uh, uh, the capillaries and uh, the blood vessels around the lung, and that will decrease the portal hypertension and will improve the diffusion of the oxygen and carbon dioxide between the lung and the, the blood vessel. Antibiotic can be given if you're suspecting infection, okay? Also, you can give the patient fluid unless they are overhydrated, such as cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Nutrition, if they're very unwell, you can start a nutrition, which is will be enteral or parental nutrition, be two days after getting them from out of the mechanical ventilation. Complication, like we said, there is sort of impaired gas exchange between um, the lung and the surrounding uh, and the surrounding blood vessel. That will lead to um, refractory hypoxemia and also VQ mismatch. Um, decreased lung compliance, and we explained why due to damage of pneumocytes type one, and basically um, the surfactant will be decreased, and the surfactant is what's responsible for the lung compliance. And pulmonary hypertension as a later stage. Thank you.